Hey guys, so in this video, I'm going to be taking a look at the NHX10. It is a 10 kilowatt inverter, and I'll go over more of the stats later. I just wanted to do a quick intro, and then I'll show you the unboxing and some of the outside of the unit, and then I can discuss some of the different stats. I don't know if you guys can see, it's kind of late in the evening, and I already have my pajama pants on, <laughs> but I couldn't wait. I wanted to see inside here. So, okay, we got the user manual, some wedge anchors. So we've seen this on other inverters. They're sending these now to where you can mount it to the wall. So for masonry, concrete, block, brick. This is a comms cable. So this could be for, I'm going to look at the manual. This could be for either parallel communication or for battery communication. It depends. Down here. This is probably the Wi-Fi. Yeah, this is the Wi-Fi dongle. And I think that goes on the bottom on these inverters. I'll take a look here. And there may be other stuff hiding in the side. So once I get this out of the box, we'll be able to see the whole inverter. There we go. It's out of the box. Looks pretty sharp. I like these angles on it here. And it is a solid little unit. It's pretty heavy. I need to look at the weight. It's smaller, actually, than I was picturing for a 10,000 watt unit. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty neat looking. I'll show you guys here the brackets that they have that mount it to the top. So these would be better if they came detached and you, you put them on yourself because they came bent. So there's foam all around everything. They did a good job with the packing, but considering these are kind of projecting out and maybe not all of them ship that way, but yeah, this one's bent here. So I'm going to have to bend, probably take it off and bend it back. And same with that one. There's brackets, same on the bottom. But those are protected because there's foam around this entire area when they ship it. So this is probably going to be easier to show while it's flat on its back. Obviously, battery positive, negative. These are all comms cables connections. So these two up here are for parallel connections. This is battery communication here. And these are both for the CTs, which those, by the way, let me go get them. These CTs were hiding in the box there. So yeah, these would be hooked right after your meter. So same as the 18 kPV, or if you guys have watched any videos on a Solark or anything like that, these right here would monitor the energy usage from the grid. That way it knows how much to export, import, stuff like that. So these are necessary when you're going to be doing any grid interactive features. I think this is going to be the best angle to look at everything. Everything is clearly labeled in here. Down below, you'll see the grounding bar. And then this is the PV input. It's a little different than some of the other models we've looked at. Instead of it being PV1 positive negative, PV2 positive negative, all the positives are on the left, all the negatives are on the right matching up, and they're numbered. Then we have generator input right here. We have grid input right here. Then we have output one. So this is your first output. Then it has a second, which this is really handy for different things. And you can set all the parameters for output two or full, whatever the parameters you set, this can kick on and start either powering a water heater or your EV, charging your EV, whatever. So this can be really handy here to have a second output. And I'll show the sides of the inverter once I get it up on the wall here. But you guys can see here the different inputs they have for each one. Everything is labeled. They've got positive and negative PV inputs there. The different comms cables, everything, all the loads. And then they've got the two inch or inch and a half, whichever it is, for the battery input probably worth popping this off so people can look under the hood. Yeah, I don't see any glaring issues. They've got insulation on some of the wire that are going through some tighter runs and good wire management overall. I thought it was interesting here, if you guys can see, the actual fans, and I can show you when I get them on the wall, the fans go through the back side. And it, I think it's similar to the 18 kPV in the sense that everything is sealed off in here because this is an outdoor rated unit. So you're not going to have any moisture, any dust in this unit itself. 
the fans are running through the backside, so they never actually go over the wind or air, never goes over the circuitry itself. That way you don't have any dust or moisture issues. But they have another fan in here, I guess, just to keep air movement going up here on the top. So this is a 48 volt, 10 kilowatt inverter, like I mentioned before. It can take in 15,000 watts of solar. It has four independent PV inputs, so solar inputs. Each one of them has a maximum of 500 volt VOC. The voltage range is 120 volts to where the MPPTs wake up to 500 volts. Each string can handle 14 amps and the max short circuit current is 22 amps. The max DC charging current is 190 amps. So if you're charging your batteries, it can charge at 190 amps. This is a split phase unit. So you can have right around 5,000 watts per leg on this unit. And I actually test that a little later and I'll show that. And since it's a 10 kilowatt unit, you're somewhere around 41 amps AC of discharge. And this is a hybrid unit, so it has grid assist options, so it can interact with the grid in ways that an off-grid inverter can't. It can assist with loads in your main panel, or the grid can assist it, just depending on how you have your settings set. So I'm going to be running my 8-gauge wire to the load 1 output right here, and then my ground to the common ground bar right there. So this is the progress so far. Here's the load output. I've got the ground in also. This is eight gauge wire. That's what the manual recommends. These are actually push, push fittings here. So if you, or push terminals, I guess, if you push right here, then you insert the terminal. So ferrules are recommended for real fine stranded wire. Six gauge would fit in this. If you were gonna use five, fine stranded, I would put a ferrule on it. And getting it into the terminal would be easier with a ferrule either way. So the max charge and discharge of this unit is 190 amps DC. This is two out wire I'm using. This wire can handle the amperage for this unit. All right, yeah, easy enough. So that came with a little protector there. This is tight. So I don't know, obviously, when I was trying to show you the different connections before, it's pretty tight in here. The fact that these are push terminals and the fact that you can just push the wire in is what makes this you know, tolerable because it is tight. Granted, you're only going to be wiring things so many times, but if you pre-bend the wire and then push it into the terminal, it's actually not that bad, but this is pretty tight. I can measure it here in just a minute. It's a tough angle, but if you're putting the tape by where the grommets are up to the board or the relays, it's probably three or three and some change there, three inches or so. So that was simple enough. The batteries are in. This is in. I'm going to hook solar up in a little bit. <clears throat> For now, though, I'm going to turn this on and test my power output from this inverter over here at the load center. So I'm gonna use the three batteries that I have, the small battery rack to start this up, the EG4 LLS models. And I did have a, this inverter I think uses Pylon Tech for its protocol. And I did have an option for that on my LifePower 4 hub, but I couldn't get it to communicate for some reason. So in the meantime, I'm gonna set this small battery rack to lead acid to start the testing. And I showed these breakers from Watts 24 seven a long time ago, I believe. So I'm gonna turn that on or close that breaker, whichever terminology you wanna use. And then down here, in order to be able to use the pre-charge resistors, I'm going to turn this breaker on. And then here, this will activate it here. And in just a minute, the inverter should start up. Yeah, there it goes. Cool. So now I'm safe to turn the other two batteries on. I can safely turn them on. Yeah, I like this display. So let me see. I know that comms failure up top means I'm not hooked up to communication, but I already knew that. So all ones. Cool, okay, now go to battery. Lead acid. And exit. There we go. We're gonna click. All alarms are off. Looks like we are good. Now I can check the panel for the output. So I wasn't getting any feed from this here. I checked the voltage, I didn't have anything. And then I realized I did not have this on. <laughs> so 
There you go, yeah, but now it is working. You can hear, let me get close. You can probably hear the fan. So it's quiet, but not as quiet as I was picturing it at idle. But then I realized that's that little internal fan keeping everything cool when you When you have that on, you cannot hear anything. I mean, it sounds like sounds like a computer, maybe, or a laptop, just a computer. Maybe a little quieter than that. So when I put the, some loads on it here, then we'll see if we can get some, some real noise out of it. Because right now, these fans have not kicked on at all. So it's just that one idling fan to keep it cool. So looking at the outside of the unit, if you're looking on the back on the left here, you see four different fans. There's a PV disconnect here, and then the RSD button. And as you guys saw, unless this is pushed in, the unit is in standby. It's on, but it's in standby, so there's no output power going from it. And on the right side, nothing exciting. Just the sticker with all the specs on it. And then you can see in here the different heat sinks that the air is blowing past for cooling. So before I get into any load tests, I'll check the idle consumption here. Uh, let's see. So you pretty much can push everything to see the status on it. So we're at 52.5 volts. You see that right there? And then let's look down here. Let's set this to DC. So 1.1. So that shows my idle consumption somewhere around 57, a little over 57 watts. So you could call it 58 watts of idle consumption. All right, I just installed the solar. Like I mentioned before, all the positives are on the left, negatives on the right. And again, there's four strings. So PV1 here, I've got the positive there and PV1 negative. All right, let's switch the PV on. There we go. So we've got... 0.8 kilowatts coming in. We could probably push this. Yeah. So it'll show voltage. We've got 4.3 amps coming in. Just at 874 watts. The sun is just coming up on that side of the array. All right, so the output is hooked up. This is six gauge wire. It is not easy to get into the outputs there. I mean, that is why they call for eight gauge, but six gauge, you can get in. I use ferrules on it. This is fine stranded wire here. So I'm gonna be running this cable to my house or my sub panel to my house to test a bunch of typical loads on it. Okay, so the house is on the inverter. You can see one leg is pulling 420, 470, the other is 178. I'm going to just use this on typical house loads for today and then maybe by this afternoon I'm going to check, do some real load tests. I just want to run it through its paces here first. I've already got 3,000 something watts on the unit right now. Between, it depends on what's cycling on and off. But I'm going to see if we can overload it here in just a minute. I'm going to turn the electric range on and a couple other items to see what we can get up to. Also, I don't have sound canceling on the mic now so that way you guys can hear this when it's up to full capacity that's got ups up to close to 5,000 oh 7,000 watts there we go so we're at 7,000 now 7,000 watts I can actually look here and we're at 4,000 and 2,000 something depending on where it's going 8,500 watts Oh, 11,000 watts, 11,000, 11.3. <laughs> so we are cycling over the rated. Oh, there it goes. So it kicked out. And you can see the overload warning there. I also hooked the Wi-Fi up. I'll show you guys what the app looks like. I hadn't showed this aspect yet or I hadn't talked about it, but um, a lot of people ask about ground neutral bond. So this unit in off grid 
it is not internally bonded at all. So right now, grid is supplying it. I have a uh, grid hooked up. It's not supplying any power, but the grid is there. And I have continuity between ground and neutral. I'll go switch the grid off, and I'll show you here in just a minute. So now the grid breaker is off, and we do not have continuity between the two. So to expound a little more on what I just showed you with the ground neutral bond, when you are on grid, so you have the grid supplying this unit as a bypass or you've got grid, grid interactive features, it is passing through the ground neutral bond to your sub panel if you have a sub panel. So it's got it taken care of there. If you were off grid, you would bond the panel yourself. This unit is not internally bonded. So there's a lot on that subject. You can look on the DIY solar forum and there is page after page on that and earth grounding and all the rest of that if you want to dive into it. So I'm going to be in the middle of moving some other stuff around shortly, but I have my charge verter on the ground here. I've got a 30 amp supply to this here, a 30 amp breaker to the charge verter, and I've got it hooked up to my large battery bank. And so the charge verter is hooked here to my larger battery bank on the main bus bars. So that's with the charge verter maxed out. And you can see each leg is right at 27, 2800. So if I turn the heat gun on again, you'll see we're at 4100 watts on L2. And then I can turn a shot back on L2 and see if it can run that as well. I'm going to turn my DeWalt miter saw on L2 also. I honestly didn't think it would start the saw up, so I'm going to turn a space heater on now and see if we can finally get it to trip from a load imbalance. There we go, 5,500 watts. Typically, on a split phase high frequency inverter, you'd be somewhere right around half. So if it's a 10,000 watt inverter, Anything over five on one leg should trip it, but it's still going. There it goes. Okay. So it must have a five or 10 second um, overload on the one leg. So I have the CTs. This is a bit of a Frankenstein thing, <laughs> but I have the CTs hooked up to the 18k PV. So the CTs that came with the unit hook into there. They have CT1 and 2. Let me see if I can focus in. There, you guys can see that. 1 and 2 there, and I'll show you over here at the 18k PV. So here they are right here on the output of the 18k. So what you see on the monitor there is what the 18k is powering so it's not just this unit but it's powering all the loads in the house so that's what it's reading l2 is powering 2100 watts and l1 is 3000 or 300 watts 330. so i had the cts hooked up to the 18k pv with the goal to try to zero out the output of the 18k PV with this inverter. And I couldn't quite figure out how to do it, so I called Ian at Watts 24-7. We talked about it, and he talked me through it here. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have that on video. They did not play well together. They actually, it was making the lights flicker. It was like an echo between the two inverters, and they didn't like playing together at all. So, but this is how you would do it. If you wanted grid interactive features, zero export, you can read about that in the manual also it does have a place as well. But if you want to be able to use those grid interactive features or this to zero out your loads in the house in the main panel, you would do self-consumption. If you don't disable this, then these will take precedence here. So you do self-consumption, you disable, sorry, I have to reach around there. So you disable that, cell enable, and then 5,000 watts is what I have the limit set on. So that is what is going to go and basically assist the main panel with any loads. All right, so final thoughts, guys. I'll go over some of the cons first, and then I'll go over the pros. 
So the first con would be the wiring compartment. So it was a real pain in the butt to get six gauge in there, and that's really where most of the problem was. If you're using eight gauge like it calls for, then you shouldn't have an issue there. Actually, the grid input allows six gauge really easy. And overall, once it's wired, it's wired, you know, it would make life easier getting everything in there, but it is workable. The second thing would be the touch screen. So it really doesn't take any pressure to be able to select different options, but sometimes you're just a fraction off and you can't actually tell where the button is. So that's kind of a picky thing, but it's not hard to deal with. You just, I mean, it's a matter of moving your finger over a little bit and trying again. The third thing would be the monitoring app. So it will show you what's being consumed and what's being used. And if you have comms hooked up, it will show you how much battery storage you have. It just could be a little nicer in my opinion. You can connect to the Wi-Fi dongle locally also. I didn't even mention that before, I don't think. And Ian at Watts 24 seven said it is compatible with solar assistance. So that may be a route that a lot of people go. And the fourth thing is sort of a picky thing, kind of like the touch screen. I would prefer to have a reset button here on the menu somewhere. Granted, the unit does auto restart if it's been overloaded or something like that, but it would just be a nice option. Really, you could utilize these units in all sorts of use cases, but I picture them being really popular with EV charging also. You could have an outdoor rated battery with an outdoor rated inverter at this price point, and you could charge your vehicle at right around 40 amps. So the first pro would be the size of it. It is a pretty small unit. So it's around 16 and three quarters wide by 27 inches tall. There is something to keep in mind though. I believe they recommend, because these have fans on the side, I think they recommend a 12 inch spacing in between units or any kind of other obstruction. Another pro is the screen. So it's funny because that was one of my sort of negatives there too. But I'm not talking about the touch screen aspect of it. I like the layout of the screen and the color. I like the way they laid out the different settings in the unit also. The only one that sort of confused me was the zero export aspect and I actually called Ian with Watts 24 seven on that one. Otherwise, all of the options are pretty easy to understand and you can walk through each thing, advanced settings, everything. Another pro is sound. This unit is extremely quiet, so it does not make a lot of sound at all. So at full PV, which I have never, I haven't hooked up 15 kilowatts to this, maybe it starts to get really loud, but I've had it at 10 kilowatts for sustained amounts of time, and it just doesn't make that much noise at all. So it's pretty impressive in that area. Another pro is the weatherproofing. Like I said, even if you're gonna be keeping this inside, it's not blowing air from the home or anywhere, your shop over the components in there. It's just blowing over the heat sinks in the back. So that, having something weatherproof, even if it's gonna be indoors, is really nice. So idle consumption is another. I got anywhere from 58 to 63 watts of idle consumption, and I think that's pretty good considering the size of the unit. So like you guys saw, to test this unit, I ran my home with it, and I did all kinds of other load tests that I didn't film because it was kind of boring, but it impressed me as far as off-grid and being able to handle load imbalances and different surges. It did really well. It did good with my water well, which is probably the largest surge that I have. It did not have any issues, and it didn't have any issues with 120 volt loads either. Honestly, I hope this unit gets more attention. I'm hoping to see more videos on it and more stuff written about it on the solar forum. I'll leave a link in the description below. You guys can see the manual on there and also look at the different wiring schematics and other stuff the inverter can do. And if you guys have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching guys and stay tuned.